In today's video, I'm going to be reviewing this new TS100 soldering iron. Before that, I'm going to give you a little history of my experience with soldering irons. If you're not into history, then please click on the time links in the description below and you can skip forward. But make sure you stay right to the end because I have a really hot tip for you. This little Antex 15 watt iron was a gift for my 9th or 10th birthday. You can tell the age of it because it says made in England. In those days, you would send off a, a postal order to, to Matlin and wait a week or so for the postman to deliver you a kit of transistors, maybe a little oscillator or a radio project. Happy days. My next step was up to this Weller iron. In around about 1973, I started working for a local electronics company assembling printed circuit boards for alarm systems and I was taught to solder and given one of these Weller soldering irons. Now the Weller was one of the only temperature controlled irons of its time and is indeed still the subject of uh, two or three patents in the US. The way it does its temperature control is really clever. Possibly not many people know that magnets when they're heated at a certain temperature lose their magnetism and provided you don't exceed that temperature too much as it cools down the magnetism comes back. You can just about make out on the end of the soldering iron tip here the little magnet and it has embossed a number 7 on it which means that this will switch at 700 degrees Fahrenheit which is around 370 degrees C. The magnet activates inside here a small magnetic thermostat which they cunningly called a magnostat and that is the subject of one of the patents I believe. To change the temperature you needed to change the bit. This bit here is stamped with the number 8 which means it's 800 Fahrenheit it'll switch at which is around 427 degrees centigrade. You can tell the age of a Weller soldering iron by the colour of the handle here. The, the black colour was in production from the 60s until the 70s. In the 70s it was replaced by this uh, rather fetching blue colour which matches the base. This is a, a later base. The iron is rated around 50 watts and it still works perfectly today. On then now to the main subject of today's video, this little TS100 or otherwise known as a SQ001 soldering iron. What does it bring to the table? Clearly we can see that it's a, a nice portable size as well as the USB connector which we will come on to. The main power connector is this 2.1 standard size jack rated from 12 to 24 volts DC and can generate from 17 to 65 watts which is quite an achievement for such a little guy. To paraphrase Crocodile Dundee, that's not a soldering iron, that's a soldering iron. This 65 watt soldering iron I modified back in the day when we were using nickel cadmium cells and making up your own battery packs. You would put a, a battery pack either side of this, heat them up until the solder melted, take the iron away, smack them together and pray that they didn't short themselves out though I guess they would have probably desoldered themselves fairly quickly as well. So that was my idea of a 65 watt soldering iron so it'll be interesting to see what we can do with this. Looking at the blurb on the box the way that it controls the temperature it has an embedded STM32 processor, uh, dual temperature sensors yada 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 heats up fast and works great mainly applicable to the maintenance of aircraft models and electronic components, circuit boards, etc. Indispensable for the electronic worker. Clearly, as you will see from my channel, one of my hobbies is uh, radio controlled aircraft and therefore it was great to see the included XT60 connector. We can use that out in the field to power our iron. This is only a small three cell pack around 12 volts nominally, so it's not going to generate a huge amount of power. Obviously you can use higher cell counts according to the power that you need, which is great. 
Previously for portable use, I reviewed this little iron which is based on a vaping type cell. I've kind of nicknamed it the, the vaping iron and you can see a link to that video up there. This works great as well, but clearly it's not as powerful as this unit here. It'll be great for repairing, maybe if you pull a wire off of a flight controller board or something like that, it'll be fine. But uh, I don't think it's going to cope with soldering maybe a wire back onto a speed controller or a battery connection. It'll be interesting to see how this copes with that. For my testing, I'm going to be using this old laptop power supply. This one happens to be adjustable, set at the moment to 19 volts and this is capable of supplying 70 watts, so we should be good to go. I'll be taking measurements with my power meter here. At the moment it's only indicating the voltage, but this will measure the peak amps and watts. Everything is in place now for the first test. The device is in its standby mode, and as it says, press button A. We can see the temperature ramping up nice and quickly there and the indication that it's heating and by default it's set to 300 degrees C which it's reached in no time so that's stabilized and we can clearly see that it's melting solder so so far so good let's just make a quick check of the tip temperature there at 300 degrees C place the thermocouple in the little pool of solder that I've just made and it's indicating a little bit low, some 280. Let's just double check that against my Haku T12 which I built from a kit here. We switch that on. That gives us a reading of slightly higher, 310, 312 there. I notice in the manual for the iron that there is a calibration so let's try that just before we look at the calibration in the booklet here it gives us the power that it should be drawing at the various voltages and we were set to 19 volts and it was indicating 39 watts so that's spot on the calibration it says here press button b in standby mode to enter the thermometer mode So here it's indicating the voltage and the temperature, which it's only indicating 7 degrees C there. In that mode, we should press the two buttons at the same time to enter the calibration mode. So once, and we're there. So I got it into the calibration mode there, but only by pressing the B button a second time. Let's just try that again. Yeah, so the instructions appear to be wrong there. But now it's in indicating 14 degrees. My thermometer here is indicating 16.7. So a little discrepancy there. Let's see if it's made any difference to the actual tip temperature. So up to temperature now, let's put a little blob of solder on the iron, place the thermocouple. It appears to have made little difference to the actual measurement of the tip temperature, again around the 270 to 80 degrees. Maybe it's time to change the firmware. In the documentation it describes how to do a firmware update, and I did look on the website indicated here, I couldn't find any, any firmware. I emailed them and kindly they have sent me a copy. But there is a completely different alternative open source firmware here on GitHub. And as always, links in the description. This brings many extra features into play. Perhaps the most interesting for me is the ability to set a lower cutoff voltage to suit the lithium cells that I'll be using. It goes through the process here for various operating systems. You go into the releases and pull down the file that you want. In my case, this will be the TS100EN English uh, hexadecimal file. 
as you can see, there are other languages available. One of the other options here is to load your own custom boot up image. You can put your name or logo on your iron and customize it, which is incredible. Back when I was programming Z80s, if somebody had said to me, one day you will have a processor in your soldering iron, which will be many, many times more powerful than what you're doing there, I would have said they were mad. And in fact, to turn the world on its head, I have seen on the internet that somebody has actually emulated a Z80 on the STM32. But back to the matter in hand, to upgrade the firmware we need to connect it via USB to our computer, obviously. And to do that we hold down the A button whilst plugging in the little USB cable. And that then indicates the DFU mode, the programming mode, and 3.45. And we can see that it's been recognised by the computer and opened as a disk drive. I'd put the file on my desktop, so let's just copy that. In fact, let's send it. Send to, and we'll send it to the drive. So it's been copied across there, and we heard it a quick uh, blip. So even before I got back to looking at the file, it's been loaded onto the soldering iron. The default extension is .hex, and now it's changed to .rdy, which means that it's ready. So having removed it, let's apply our power source once again. And it tells me the settings were reset. And we have uh, a nice little logo indicating the soldering iron and the spanner there so that the settings are entered by pressing the B button. If we use the B button, we can see that there's a whole number of options, the soldering settings, sleep mode, the user interface, and advanced. That's quite incredible. Let's press button A now. So it appears that the default temperature is some 320 degrees C. Let us see what our meter makes of it. Oh, that's neat. I've just noticed that when I moved the iron, it switched the display around. Oh, isn't that neat? And that is indicating much more closely what the iron is indicating. So this firmware appears to have a better temperature control. So 321 on the iron, 328 on the thermometer. A great result there, I think you'll agree. Time for a real world example now. I've turned my power supply up to 24 volts to more closely resemble what I'm going to be using, which these lithium battery packs. But these are only 12 volts, therefore I shall need to wire two in series, so I need to make up a little lead to do that. So first I'm going to do the joint in the middle. The iron is set to 320. It's in standby mode at the moment. Let's see how it copes with this joint. So we're up to temperature now. I won't be able to see what the meter is reading for the power. This is quite a sizable job for any iron. Let's take a closer look at the join. So yes, uh, functional if not aesthetically pleasing as I say. There are some quite respectable joints there, I think. Nice and shiny, a little bit blobby, but um, as far as I'm concerned, that passes muster. A final check now of my field setup with the two lithium cells in series. Now that's coming out at just 25 volts, so I hope the extra volt is not going to let the magic smoke out. Let's find out. Everything looks good. Power it on. It should get up to temperature within 11 seconds at 24 volts. 
Yep, so that's, uh, that's an excellent result there. Just looking on the meter here, the maximum amps was 3 amps and 74 watts. But remember that's with the, the new firmware. I'm not exactly sure what the spec is for that. But this is going to be a really useful addition to the field toolkit and I'm very, very pleased with this iron and great thanks to Banggood for sending it to me. Of course, we mustn't forget our hot tip. Let me just let this cool down a moment. When I first assembled the iron, I was struck by the similarity of the bits to those used in my Haku T12. Let's try one and see. Is it going to go bang? Up to temperature. So how about that? If you happen to have a Haku T12, you can use all the bits from that as well. Happy days!